Hey, Sleepy Sheepy here. Today we're going to be looking at a build that's a little bit different than my normal style of builds. This build is going to be aimed specifically for beginners or people that are looking to create their first PvP focused build. So recently I made a video that really talked about a lot of the things that I thought were useful to think about when approaching PvP for the first time, and I didn't really include a build with it, so this is going to be that showcase. I'm going to be going into a little bit more detail than I might normally, just because this is aimed at newer players, so feel free to skip this intro, but if you are new and are wondering how to set up a build, for the most part I like to focus on a single weapon, and at lower levels or medium levels I like to focus on putting all of my points to kind of build around that weapon stat. So for this build show case we're going to be looking at the claymore which has a b scaling and strength when it's heavy infused 16 strength requirement and 13 dex requirement so basically we're looking to maximize our stats for strength and then hit the necessary stats for dexterity as well as make sure we have enough endurance to wear the armor we want to wear as well as enough vigor to make sure we can make mistakes so for this build we're going to be at level 85 i find 85 to be a really nice spot to be at because you're going to be facing players that are co-oping more likely than ganking, which is going to be really nice since you'll be able to play a variety of skill levels. You'll also be able to deal a decent amount of damage when you're facing overleveled phantoms, so at lower levels you might struggle to deliver enough damage in each of your attacks to really do much damage to overleveled phantoms. So that's going to be a big part of why I like 85. And then you can also make yourself a little bit more tanky at this level. So we're going to be running about 1700 HP with all of our talismans and the vigor of 47 and that's going to mean we can make a lot of mistakes in the process and still survive which is going to be one of the most helpful things in learning pvp for the first time the rest of the stats for this build are going to be 47 points into strength 13 into dexterity and 22 into endurance and really nothing else so we're really maximizing our strength stat and making sure we have enough endurance to wear the armor that we have so for this build i'm recommending 100 poise which is a solid break point for patch 1.08 and we get that with the banished knight helm altered the beast champion armor the bulgo gauntlets as well as the scaled greaves we also have the bulgo talisman which raises our poise further and to make sure we can wear this armor with our current endurance level, we're using the Great Jar's Arsenal, which boosts our mas maximum equip load, and then Urchi's Favor plus two, which also boosts our equip load as well as maximum HP. So that's going to be pretty helpful. And then we also have Shard of Alexander on this build. That's going to increase the damage that our Ashes of War do. We can switch this over to different types of Talisman. So if you're more likely to go for jumping attacks and Ashes of War, maybe the Claw Talisman. Or if you go for a lot of critical attacks, the Dagger Talisman might be good. And then you'll also note that we have a parry tool on our offhand. So getting good at parries is something that I find to be pretty useful and it takes some time, but it's nice to have the option available to you. We also have carrying retaliation on this parry shield, so that's going to be a good option if we are getting magic spam sent our way and we want to be able to kind of send some back. You'll also see me using consumables frequently throughout the course of these invasion showcases, and I find consumables to be really helpful. I didn't incorporate them until later in my PvP experience, but I found that once I did, I really couldn't really live without them. So something like a freezing pot is going to be a great way to start your invasion if you can get somebody frostbitten as early as possible it means you're going to be doing more damage while they are frostbitten and you'll also deal some damage in the process having uh, something with poison on it can be nice if you have really passive players poisoning them can just kind of increase pressure so i like to keep poison bone darts on hand and then volcano rope pots can be really nice for zoning so that's a way to kind of block areas that your opponents might want to go so let's say you're running down a hallway you drop a couple of volcano pots they leave a aoe that does damage if you run through it so that might take up the entire hallway and anybody that runs through it is going to take damage so it really discourages people from following you if you don't want to be followed i also want to talk about how i set up my pouch so I used to keep my healing stuff and physics and FP stuff just in my soft swap bar, so by pressing B or down on the D-pad. And this was not a great system. Having the pouch available means that you have access to any of four of these things regardless of where your soft swap bar is. And that may save your life in a lot of different situations. So initially, I just put, you know, my Crimson Flasks on my soft swap bar. And that was kind of carried over from Dark Souls 3 days. 
but once I made the change over to this, it felt like night and day. And uh, having these three, I think, is pretty straightforward. But having fan daggers as one of your options, I think, is pretty pretty good way to go because it means you can get quick damage at range anytime you want. So just being able to send a fan dagger at your opponent means that if they have one HP left and you have a slow weapon, you'll still be able to kind of chip them if you hit them with the fan dagger. So just having that available without needing to swap through your soft swap bar is going to be really nice. Next, I want to talk about my mix physics. So because this is a strength build and we can still benefit from some extra strength, we'll be using the strength crystal knot tier and then we'll also be using the crimson bubble tier so when i'm setting up my mix physic i usually like to use one tier to boost my attacking power and then one tier to kind of negate some damage or at least help me maintain higher hp so i usually run the crimson bubble tier it saved my life a ton of times just because getting a little hp back when you're close to death is really helpful especially if you're getting stun locked a bunch or you know you just need a little bit of extra health so those two things are going to be great if you don't know they are visible to other players so the glowing orb inside my chest indicates that i have the crimson bubble tier and then the red aura around my body is going to indicate that in some way my ar is buffed being able to recognize recognize the different status effects that players have on them is going to be really helpful in the long run. So something like the red effect that you see right now, but that's actually gold is going to mean that your player is using regen. And so it would behoove you to maybe poison them or be more aggressive against them because they are using regen because the longer you just kind of wait around the more health they get back so just being aware of the different status effects in the game and what they do is going to really help you in kind of how you approach different situations in pvp long term i also do want to mention that i am providing a lot of information when you're new to pvp it can be helpful to just kind of focus on a simple aspect of what you're doing and so this build is kind of meant to be fairly simple but also something with a lot of depth so it can be good when it's you know played with a, a fairly simple approach, but it can also be really deadly when it's played with a more advanced approach. And that's part of the reason why I really like this particular build. So another reason that I really like this build is that the moveset has quite a variety to it. It is one type of build where you're really rewarded for using the entire moveset. So we're gonna start off with just neutral attacks. It has these kind of diagonal sweeping attacks for the most part if you're two-handing it, which I do recommend since that boosts your strength. However, it can be nice to switch over to the one-handed move set just because you get these horizontal sweeps. And having that little extra range on the side of your attacks can be really helpful for either hitting multiple opponents or just you know clipping somebody with your backswing, which can be a, a really nice way to kind of throw off their timing. So. We're going to be looking mostly at the two-handed move set, but it is good to know that the one-handed move set is also strong. So, the neutral heavy attack is going to be one of the best neutral heavy attacks in the game, in my opinion. It comes out as a thrust, which has decent range, and if you can do a neutral light attack, stun like your opponent, and then if they roll away, you can usually deliver a uncharged heavy attack, which will roll catch them. So being able to just kind of utilize the different movesets available to you with this weapon is going to be really important. It also has a great jumping attack, which comes out as sweep. If you do a jumping light and then a jumping heavy, it comes out as kind of a slam down. And then you'll also be able to incorporate different aspects. So a backstep attack or a reverse backstep attack, those are things that you know, are going to be a little bit more advanced, but over time you can kind of keep them on your radar and incorporate them into your play style as you kind of get better and learn about new things. So those different aspects of the moveset are going to be really important. And then we're also going to talk about our Ash of War. So for this build, I put on Impaling Thrust, and then I also have a second Claymore, which has Flaming Strike on it. So those two are very good options for the Claymore. I would say if you had to pick just one, Flaming Strike is going to be your best bet, especially if you're new, because it can be really helpful to just kind of control different people around you. You have this big stun locking AOE that kind of 
protects you a little bit and is also aggressive. And it also has a follow up where if you press the heavy attack button, you'll be able to swing your sword again and it will buff your sword in the process. But Impaling Thrust is really nice because you can get a long stun lock chain where you roll catch with the heavy attack if you go from neutral to heavy, and then you can follow that up with Impaling Thrust and you'll usually be able to get your opponent three times in a row and oftentimes kill them. Another important aspect of this moveset is gonna be the running attack. So the running light is not really too notable, but the running heavy is gonna be really solid. And what I like about the running heavy is that it really trains you to roll catch your opponents. So when this attack is so delayed like this, it means that you can't just run after your opponent and really immediately hit them with damage. But what you can do is kind of anticipate when they're going to roll and then line up the end of your attack with the end of their roll and do damage in the process. So you'll see me incorporate that a lot in these invasions. And it's one of the reasons that I really like the Claymore as a beginner weapon is because it really teaches good habits about kind of how to use your attacks, when to time them, and just not really spamming and hoping to get lucky and rather being more deliberate with the types of attacks you deliver. I also wanted to mention that the crouch attack and rolling attack, which are always the same, both come out as pokes and those can be really helpful as well. And then also charging your heavy attack can be a great way to just kind of inflict damage on your opponent if they're rushing in at you, you can just kind of charge your attack and oftentimes the delay of your follow-up will kind of throw off their timing and if you land your hit then you'll be doing quite a bit of damage. If you are going for a lot of charge attacks, you can use the Axe Talisman which will boost those charge attacks and you can also use the Spear Talisman because it will boost your counter attack damage which happens when your opponent is in the process of attacking you if their animation is interrupted by your attack or happens simultaneously with their animation of attack, you'll get extra damage, which counts as counter damage. So if you've made it this far into the video, I definitely appreciate you kind of listening through me talking about this. I know that a lot of this might be review if you've come out of a lot of PVE, but all of this will definitely come in handy when you're approaching PVP for the first time or when you're approaching invasions for the first time. With that said, if you wouldn't mind considering subscribing, that would be amazing, and let's go ahead and jump into our invasions. All right, so jumping into our first invasion, we have a 3v1 with a pretty aggressive group of people. So understanding the level of aggression that you're facing is gonna be really helpful in an invasion. If you're playing really passive players, you might take one approach, whereas if you're playing aggressive players, you're gonna need to make sure you have yourself covered and really look for windows of opportunity within the course of the invasion where you're gonna be able to deliver some damage without taking too much damage in the process. So you can see at the beginning here, things are pretty bad. I'm getting attacked by multiple people in an area with no PVE. And so you can see me right away using some volcano pots to just kind of discourage players from following me. And this gives me a little bit more space to kind of avoid uh, damage coming my way as well as get some health in the process. So then I switch over to a uh, Claymore with Flaming Strike and here I do what's called isolating an opponent. They hopped on this elevator to send it up so I couldn't use it but I was able to stun lock them while they were still on the elevator and at a certain point the elevator got so high that they would jump off and die or stay in there with me. So I was able to continuously stun lock them and isolate them and take out an opponent that otherwise would have been very difficult to kill. And here are probably two of my best free throws with a freezing pot. So I get one on the way down and then another right as I come in and that frostbites both opponents there. So there's just a nice moment where you can definitely kind of free aim some consumables and try to get some damage in the process. It's probably not going to work out like that every time. It definitely doesn't for me, but you know, getting comfortable with free aiming uh, consumables is going to be something that's beneficial in the long run. So I would say don't focus too much on that at the beginning, but as you're looking to kind of increase your skill level, increase kind of the complexity of your play style, consumables are going to be a great way to go. And if you want to incorporate them early, that's fine too. So you'll also see me use my parry shield to use carry and retaliation against the faith incantation that I see from the other phantom. So here I'm really focusing on this other phantom, but they've switched up their play style. And to be honest, that threw me off a little bit 
They are now going for attacks with a weapon that has maximum poise damage, so I'm not going to be able to poise tank or trade with any of their attacks. And they're also kind of going for a very... Um, they're alternating between passiveness and aggression, and that's something you'll frequently see in multi-opponent um, play styles where you have a player that waits for you to attack and be aggressive and then attacks you. Otherwise, you can see that they're not really aggressing me at all, and that's because if they were to aggress me, I'd be in a better position to punish them since the host isn't doing too much. So understanding kind of the play style of your opponents will come with time. It's something that is pretty slow at first, but you kind of start to see all the different play styles that you can play against and understand what works against them. So I get pretty low on health and I need to back off. I know that that particular attack is going to be one that is a quick punish on what I'm trying to do, uh, which is heal. So I go for a double heal in that moment, but in the process of kind of zoning, so using the flaming strike ash of war to kind of keep everybody away i do manage to kill the host so in some cases it can be better to just ignore the phantom don't try to be too prideful about the way that you're approaching the invasion and just kill the host you know when they come along so i think you can definitely die in the process of trying to avoid killing the host and it can really be to your detriment so here we have another example of that, and this is going to be kind of a standard 2v1 where it started out maybe as a little bit of an honor fight, but then they didn't like how it was going, so they both got involved, which is fairly typical for invasions, and I kind of needed to back off, and this is going to be a good invasion to just kind of look at priority. So priority is kind of the idea that you have a turn to deliver damage and they have a turn to deliver damage. So when it's your turn, you may be able to kind of maintain your priority in the course of the fight, or you may lose it. One way to lose your priority is to roll out of an attack. So if you, you know, go for a neutral light attack and then you roll immediately after, everything resets back to neutral and you don't have kind of priority or aggression that you can deliver in the process. So really understanding when it's your turn to go for an attack or when it's your turn to be defensive is important. And that's kind of the downfall of the host in this particular invasion. You'll see that I do manage to kind of back up and get some more health in the process. And here I go for a heavy attack, then deliver a light attack, then deliver another heavy attack. And those three attacks together stun locked my opponent and I was able to kill them, you know, with just those three hits. So that was a moment where they didn't appreciate that I had a weapon that was fast enough to maintain priority for three hits, and they just got hit for all three hits and died. So next up we have a longer invasion, and this is gonna be an invasion that just kind of showcases the kind of approach that you can have with the Claymore and how to utilize it against lots of different things. So Immediately, I kind of noticed that one player is a little bit weaker than the others. I did quite a bit of damage on the player that's healing right now, and I toss a freezing pot their way, and I almost kill them, and here I just am trying to be aggressive. So one thing that is difficult about the Claymore is that you can't chase down people as well as something like a thrusting sword. So that's going to be something that is kind of difficult to deal with when you're using this weapon, but part of the reason that I also recommend it. So, you know, being deliberate with your chase downs is going to be important, but it's also going to be kind of difficult with this weapon. And I do think it's important to have some level of difficulty with your first PvP weapon, because it will teach you good habits and then make other weapons that you use in the future just easier to use, rather than you needing to kind of unlearn some habits that you had and then just ignoring whole weapon classes because they don't really align with the type of weapon that you want to use. So I would say if you use dual thrusting swords as your first PvP setup, you're really going to be using a lot of light attacks and you're kind of going to be going for kind of spammy attacks, especially if you put something like bleed on it. Not to say that that's not a good build and that it's not effective, but the habits that you're going to learn in the process of that is going to make a lot of other different weapons that are available in Elden Ring feel really bad by comparison. And it's not because they are bad, it's just because the PvP playstyle that you're used to is not going to really be beneficial for the, the moveset, and it's just going to feel hard and not really beneficial. So that's one of the reasons I really like the Claymore, is because it's... It has variety, it has a good moveset, but it takes time and skill to learn, 
and it really kind of opens the door for you to be able to use whatever you want in the future. And I think that's more important than just, you know, winning invasions when you first start. I think learning good habits as soon as possible rather than needing to unlearn bad habits is going to be really solid for the way you uh, just kind of play the game long term. And it's going to mean that you'll be able to enjoy the game for longer because you'll be able to kind of change up your build and just kind of have fun with the full scope of the game. So that was kind of a, a long winded way to explain why I really like the Claymore versus other setups, but also just to be aware that not every aspect of the move set is going to be easy. And that's part of the reason why I'm suggesting it as a weapon that you use at the beginning. So kind of to jump back into what's going on in this invasion, we have uh, two players that aren't dealing a ton of damage, but they are playing really passively. So I'm having a lot of trouble kind of getting them to leave the particular area that they're in right now. And that's something that you'll definitely see throughout the course of invasions is a group of people that just want to stay where they are because there's no PVE. And it's good to have some setups to combat that. So I'm not saying that when you first jump into PVP, you should be able to do what I'm doing right now, which is you know using incantations like Bestial Vitality to give me a regen over time. And you can see the kind of gold little marks around my body to indicate that I do have regen happening. Um, but that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just kind of giving myself more time. I'm trying to take advantage of the fact that they are playing really passively by punishing them with the fact that I can get more health. So. I like to try to approach every single moment of an invasion as a way to give myself an advantage. So even if you have a weapon like the Claymore, which doesn't have you know the most range, it's not magic based or something where it has projectiles, that doesn't mean that when your opponents are out of reach, you can't do something. So one thing you can do is kind of buff yourself or you know set up regen with your build or you know, eat a consumable. So that's one way to just kind of deliver a self buff when you have extra time. And then another thing you can do is use consumables that are projectiles. So something like fan daggers or poison bone darts or, you know, freezing pots. I was actually out of freezing pots for the duration of this build, which is one reason I'm not using them, but really being able to kind of punish the different aspects of what your opponents are doing in just small ways is going to kind of contribute to your overall success. So I've been out of health for quite some time. I'm in kind of a bad spot where I'm trying to use just the little pillars associated with the elevator as protection. And you'll also note that I'm not playing locked on. So when you're trying to get through doorways and stuff, it's pretty important to be able to accurately get through that doorway. And when you're playing locked on, it means that your character model is going to move differently depending on where your opponent is. So knowing when to switch from locked to unlocked is going to be really important. And you'll see really good players do that a lot where they'll very fluidly be able to play locked or unlocked. And getting used to kind of incorporating your right joystick while you're doing that is, you know, fairly difficult and it may not really work well with you know needing to press b or something if you're using a um, xbox controller or circle if you're on playstation but it is important to just kind of understand that certain circumstances are going to require you to unlock from your opponents and you'll really get a nice benefit from that so right now i'm really just kind of waiting them out a little bit restoring my health so i can come back and uh, approach them with some aggression and really they're they're not doing anything which I'm kind of using to my benefit. And even if they are, um, you know, using regen or something, I'm able to, you know, get some of my health back. And I feel that's pretty important. And at this point, what happens is they resummon in uh, the player from the beginning who I killed. And that's definitely something that can happen, but I'm actually kind of happy about that because it means that I have kind of an easy kill that I can go for and get some heals in the process. So that's one aspect of PVP that's kind of nice. Every time you get a kill, if it's a regular phantom, you get one flask. And if it's a blue phantom, then you get two flasks. And that can be super beneficial just you know with restoring HP in the process. So they were going for some around the corner attacks. I really liked that. So I tried to incorporate that myself and I go for flaming strike from around the corner. So just kind of using a blind spot within the context of what they can see to my advantage was extremely helpful. I killed that phantom, so now I have one more health. 
to, to use within the context of this invasion, but I actually do manage to get a chase down on the other player. So I kind of separated the two in between that doorway where one was on one side of the doorway and the other was on the other. And that was enough to allow me to kind of get a chase down on the phantom that was really kind of a thorn in my side throughout the course of this invasion. So once it's a one-on-one, -on -one, it's not so hard. Um, I'm trying to kind of bait them into more aggression using some poison bone darts and I'm able to come through with a win here. Next up we're going to have a 3v1, although it functions closer to a 1v1 and then a 2v1 where the opponents don't really have good coordination and that's something to definitely appreciate in the context of an invasion. I see the winged scythe being used which does have the ability to prevent you from healing so I try to just kind of roll away from that as much as I can and at this point the first phantom is kind of isolated here. They're going through a poison bog that prevents you from moving quickly so rather than trying to chase them slowly I go for a jump attack and just kind of understanding moments when you can use jumping to your advantage is going to be important it means you might be able to get somewhere a little bit more quickly and so in that moment I think I was definitely in the the right play to utilize a jump rather than just kind of sprinting through the poison bog so at this point it's just a one-on-one -on -one, and I know that the host is pretty low on health they haven't really leveled their vigor too much so I go for a couple attacks on the phantom with the dual colossal swords and I was able to kind of land that combo that I mentioned in the beginning of this video which involves hitting them with a neutral light attack and then following it up with a heavy poke and that's going to be really helpful and here I'm able to kind of do the second part of the combo that I mentioned earlier in this video which was going for a heavy attack and following it up with the ash of war impaling thrust which is also a very strong combo. So this next invasion I also thought was kind of a interesting showcase of just kind of dealing with two pretty aggressive players in an area where you don't have much PvE but you do have a little bit of protection. So utilizing your environment is going to be extremely important. Here I use that pillar to kind of take advantage of the casting that the host is doing and then go for some attacks on the phantom without really needing to worry about needing to roll when those giant um, stones are coming my way. So I'm also using the pillar to kind of avoid the extra frost damage that's coming from the phantom and just, you know, maintaining agility throughout this environment while also going for some attacks when I feel like I'm in a good spot too. So one thing that's worth noting within the context of this build is that we have 22 endurance, which isn't that much. So that's gonna be nice because we get to put other stats into something like health or damage output, but it also means that we're gonna have to manage our stamina. And that's something that I didn't really appreciate, I think as early as I should have when learning PVP and just understanding that it's almost always going to be worth it to let your stamina regen rather than let it kind of run out so you can go for an attack and th that's going to be really beneficial in terms of staying alive long term so unless you know that your attack is going to poise break your opponent and you'll get a second it's pretty much the best to just like avoid attacking and go into neutral to let your stamina come back a little bit and it also encourages you to not always be sprinting after your opponent so if you're always sprinting after your opponents you're not going to get an opportunity to regenerate your health and or your stamina rather so just understanding that eventually you will run out of stamina and if you're caught doing an attack while your stamina is regenerating you're not going to be able to roll out of that attack and that is really important because you're going to be stuck in your attack animation even after the hitbox is gone and that means that you're going to be susceptible to taking damage so really in incorporating good stamina management is super important and understanding that in some cases you might be able to animation cancel the attack that you're going for after it's over and get some iframes a little bit sooner means that you might kind of dodge incoming damage and just be in a better spot so keeping an eye on your stamina is almost as important as keeping an eye on your health and they are very closely related to each other in terms of how both are managed so that was right there a moment when i went for a very deliberate kind of uh, parry bait so I don't always go for parries but when I do I try to make sure that they're very intentional so what I did right there was go for a fully charged heavy attack when I was clearly out of range of my opponent 
and I was anticipating that they were going to try and punish that kind of missed attack with their own aggressive attack. And so knowing when your opponent is going to be aggressive is going to be really helpful for baiting a parry. Um, obviously, you have to be kind of comfortable with the timings of parries, and that just comes with time. And then once you are comfortable with kind of baiting a parry, or landing a parry rather, then you can learn how to bait them, which essentially just kind of means that you're going to be able to predict with some degree of certainty when an attack is going to arrive, and you'll be able to cue that parry kind of right before that happens. So this is another invasion where I ended up kind of accidentally killing the host before killing the phantom. They kind of got in the line of fire, but I didn't let it deter me and just kind of, you know, wave goodbye to the phantom there. So next up we have a 3v1. And this was just kind of a, an interesting invasion, I thought, from the context of both using consumables, dealing with something like Moon Veil and a shield, and then having a host that kind of... Uh, they, they really got out of the picture pretty early. So right there, they run off screen, and I think they fall down into an area where they can't easily get back to. So that was kind of a nice moment of just knowing the map and standing around an area where people can fall in. And then I'm just left with two players. One of them is pretty tanky, but the other one is pretty low on vigor and is using Moonvale. So it's important to kind of respect Moonvale when you see it. It's a weapon that can do a ton of damage and stun lock you. Although you're less likely to be stun locked by it now than you used to be, which is really nice the magic part of the Ash of War no longer is a guaranteed stun lock. So that's going to be really nice in terms of being able to get away from Moonvale in particular. And you can see here that I'm just trying to kind of trade hits with my opponents and, and just do damage uh, as often as I can. So there I wasn't in range of using my Claymore, but I switched over to Freezing Pots and managed to Frostbite the player with the Halberd. And here I noticed that they're using their shield a lot and landing a heavy attack on a shield does a bunch of stamina damage and if they don't have enough stamina to kind of hold that shield up they will get guard broken and then um, they'll be open for a repost. So one thing that you'll notice there in kind of the last minute or so was that I got the guard break on the player with the shield and rather than chasing them down I immediately went to be aggressive on the other player and this was because I anticipated that the player with the large shield would you know kind of back off and i wouldn't be in a great spot to chase them down and i also figured that the player with moon veil would be really aggressive so rather than trying to chase down a player while i have moon veil behind me i chose to be aggressive against the player with moon veil well i can anticipate that the player with the shield is going to be kind of backing off and needing to heal and that left me alone with the moon veil player long enough to kind of get the um, necessary damage to kill them and then it was just a one-on-one -on -one where I was able to kind of finish off the player with the halberd so eventually I do kind of catch up to the player with that fell down at the very beginning of this invasion and they're not really healing which I, I definitely respected and just kind of using a colossal sword which is always fun to see and it does come out a little bit faster than other colossal swords so it can be difficult to kind of judge when to roll but you do get used to it over time uh, for the most part, and eventually I was able to just kind of anticipate their next attack and then go for a jumping attack that finished them off. Uh, coming up next, we have an invasion with kind of the infamous IGN build. So if you're not familiar, there is a glitch where, or exploit, or, you know, it's not totally clear what it is, but essentially you can deliver uh, blood loss buildup just by being in the vicinity of another player if you buff your weapon in a certain way and use fire uh, fire's deadly sin i believe is the name of the pyromancy so what they're doing is just being near me and delivering blood loss buildup but they're not really playing aggressively with their scythe so that would have been a better play it allowed me to just kind of tank um, the blood loss buildup and it you know took long enough to build up where I wasn't constantly stunlocked by it, which is definitely a concern depending on how the build is set up. And I was eventually able to just kind of take them out. So I didn't maintain aggression on the host because I saw that a blue came into the world and I felt like it would be more fun to just kind of play uh, another player rather than end the invasion. And that's something that I also recommend, um, you know, when you're at a certain point of familiarity with PVP, 
is to just kind of uh, keep invasions going. If there's another player in the world, it's another opportunity to kind of practice. This host wasn't too much of a challenge. You can see that they don't have a ton of HP, so getting the opportunity to fight another player in the context of that particular invasion was pretty nice. So next up, we're gonna be looking at a loss, and I don't often put losses in my videos, not because I think that, you know, I never die and don't wanna show it, or, you know, that I have some ego issue. It's just that uh, I think for the most part, I do need to convince my audience that I am decent at this game, and showing a bunch of losses is not an effective way to do that. But um, to think that I don't lose or haven't lost probably thousands of times uh, would be kind of silly, and uh, especially with kind of the, players in this game and the amount of burst damage that you can encounter, uh, losses are very inevitable in terms of learning PvP. So here I'm on my back foot, I'm you know at a point where there's so many different projectiles coming my way, I'm having a hard time not panic rolling, which is definitely something you want to avoid. And things felt a little bit manageable at the beginning before this blue came in, but there's two players with Moonveil now and then a player with uh, Cross Naginatas. And at this point, I'm really trying to keep my health up and then go for Windows of Opportunity against the blue because I feel like the blue is a player that uh, I'm more likely to kill than anybody else. I got the parry early on on the Phantom and it didn't do that much damage. So I know that they're pretty tanky, potentially over leveled, and I really need to do my best to stay alive. So here I go for an unlocked approach as I'm running away. And that was something I should have done earlier. I kind of ran into a wall because I was looking at other players. And I do manage to get a turn and burn with Flaming Strike on the blue there. But here I just get stun locked twice. Uh, pretty consecutively, so I get hit with Moonveil, and that was enough to stunlock me once, and then get hit by the dual cross Naginatas, and then as I'm running away, I get hit one more time with Moonveil. So that's something that can totally happen. This build is not perfect. There are definitely gank setups that are going to be very effective against this build, but I'm not really focusing on that because that's kind of a different level of PvP, in my opinion, where you need a kind of a technical setup to deal with all the different aspects of, uh, you know, like magic spam, and it's much more suitable for a high level invasion. So something like um, you probably want to have a hard swap with Bloodhound Step so you can kind of get away and heal when you get a lot of damage coming your way, and then maybe something like a Colossal Sword with um, Waves of Darkness, which is an Ash of War that has a huge AoE and can kind of stunlock multiple opponents at the same time, so that would be a nice way to just kind of avoid uh, incoming damage or kind of decrease the pressure and just having a hard swap to something like Bloodhound Step will allow you to get in an area that potentially has PvE or maybe uh, allows you to isolate an opponent and then you also are going to want burst damage so some of the really good players who frequently kill you know everybody involved in a kind of dedicated gank team might switch over to dual lances and that's going to be a setup that just has kind of insane um, burst damage where if you land a, a jumping attack with the right talisman set up you can uh, potentially one shot uh, often two shot people so there are dedicated builds that kind of are set up to handle almost anything that you'll encounter in pvp and i don't claim that this is one of them uh, this does have some deficiencies against certain types of groups of players but i think to get to the point where you're playing against um, kind of dedicated ganks and being able to counter everything they do precisely takes a, a long time and it's not really what a beginner build is all about and you know it may be tempting to kind of utilize a build that's a little bit more meta so something like um, rivers of blood for a long time was just kind of the ultimate like um, it felt like beginner PvP weapon, which was really, really strong, and you could get a lot of wins with it, but you might not learn too much in the process. So that's part of the reason I recommend level 85, is there's fewer ganks that you encounter, and you can kind of just learn PvP and uh, kind of appreciate the different elements of your build without having to worry too much about... Uh, you know, three moon veils at the same time or cross Naginatas or something. So uh, I don't claim this is perfect. It definitely has some issues associated with it when it comes to really high burst damage or really like spammable group situations. But I do think that when you encounter, you know, groups that are either co-oping or just using kind of more 
typical Elden Ring weapon. So like Bloodhound Fang is going to be one you see a lot. Moonlight like Greatsword is going to be one you see a lot. Uh, you know, Blasphemous Blade. Like all of these are fairly typical, and I think the Claymore can kind of hold its own against those types of weapons. So this is going to be one kind of long invasion where we have two blues that come into the world, and I, I would say everybody is. Um, I, I don't want to be like, I don't want to offend anybody, but fairly average with their skill level. Um, and that's not super uncommon to see from blues, although blues can definitely be uh, of a higher level than what you're anticipating. So if they are a high level and they are pretty skilled in PvP, they're definitely something to look out for. But sometimes they're just like players that want to help out uh, co-opers and that's totally fine. Um, I, <laughs> they definitely get a bad rep in the PvP community just because they, they get a, a reputation of being like the fun police because you might be doing well in an invasion and then a blue shows up and just kind of comes behind you and kills you. Um, and that can be hard to deal with, but I do think they're kind of an important element of PvP in general. I think it's nice to give hosts an added layer of protection. Um, and it can be very satisfying. So whether or not you should be able to kind of infinitely spawn in blues is, is a whole other conversation, but uh, the concept of them in general, I think, is very fair and something I enjoy about this particular uh, game. So I do manage to kill one of the blues here, and at this point I'm kind of trying to uh, avoid any incoming attacks from the host and get a couple of quick attacks in on the blue and using the train to my advantage just being able to kind of jump up and jump down off this kind of hill is, is really nice and you'll also see me use the stairs behind me right now as well as the balcony to just kind of incorporate some um, like blocking in the terrain so if you need to jump over a railing or something your opponent isn't going to be able to attack you in that moment. They may be able to attack you on the way down, but uh, it can just be helpful to kind of diffuse tension and kind of be unpredictable. So there I think about jumping off the railing and decide that I want to stay in the area. Uh, so I don't hop over, but I do let the host summon in one of the phantoms, I believe from the beginning. And here I wanted to create more uh, freezing pots, but I didn't have that option available to me because I was still in combat. So that's just why I had the menu open. Sometimes you're able to kind of quickly recreate consumables if you're out of them. But here we can also see the, the players kind of using the terrain to their advantage. So it does work both ways where the host is using madness incantations but they're not coming fast enough to really protect this phantom, and I'm able to kind of get some stun lock chains in the process that are enough to kind of get the cl uh, phantom close to death and then uh, eventually just kind of get the rhythm of their attacks and deliver a final jumping attack that kills them. So at this point, we've killed quite a few uh, kind of helper players, and I think it's time to kind of go for the final blow on the host here. So. Uh, I am able to just kind of tank a couple of their attacks, which is why it's useful to have higher poise. Um, I would say the poise level of this build is going to be one of the, may, maybe crutches of this build, which um, I, I'm not sure, you know, to what extent you want to use kind of crutches or kind of make things hard for yourself. Uh, there's certainly a aspect of from software game uh, players that <laughs> they really want to make things hard for themselves as early as possible. Um, I would say having poise is going to be useful just to allow you to kind of get more hits in and then gradually you may want to kind of sacrifice some poise for different elements of your build, but at least having it in the context of, you know, a great sword where you can learn what kind of poise trades are and how, you know, poise works and kind of anticipate what poise um, break points are going to be important. That, that's all going to be uh, useful. And so that's one thing I do want to mention with the Great Sword is that it will poise break your opponent with every hit it delivers unless they have hyper armor. So hyper armor is something that happens when you are using predominantly heavy weapons, but it can also apply to Ash of War. So if you think that you're going to be able to interrupt your opponent's attack because, um, you know, your weapon has a decent amount of poise damage, then you're gonna, you know, play differently. So being able to interrupt other players is really important and understanding when that can happen is also really important. So if you see a player with a colossal sword, you're gonna have a very hard time interrupting 
their attack once they start swinging, and that's because that attack has hyper armor, which essentially functions as extra poise that they have only for the duration of their animation. And that's something that this weapon has a little bit of, and it's also something that is going to be kind of negated by other weapons. So I feel that the Claymore is pretty good for kind of teaching how that functions because you'll get used to poise breaking your opponents in some moments, but then you won't be able to poise break them in other moments. Eventually that may lead you into other less poise intensive builds, something like dual daggers or something where you're really going for more trades and understanding damage per second rather than something like high damage or burst damage. So uh, there's lots of different ways to kind of set up builds early on, but this is intended to mostly just be the most informative. So kind of jumping back into the invasion that's currently going on, this was another one that I felt was more kind of a practice invasion. So here I'm really allowing other blues to get summoned into the world and I'm also trying to incorporate the environment again. So using that trap that's on the ground is something that's really going to be helpful within the context of just your environment and kind of tricking your opponent. So this player that's the host who I'm kind of letting survive until um, they're out of kind of summons or too many blues have come in or just no more blues are coming, um, they're pretty aware of this particular trap. So I'm not really able to kind of lure them into it, but I am able to pretty effectively lure multiple other opponents into it. And eventually I do kind of just <laughs> mess with them a little bit longer. I would say I uh, drag this out maybe more than you should, but when you do have an opponent that is clearly below your skill level, it's a great time to just kind of practice things that are... Um, maybe more difficult to land. So you, you see me pull out my parry shield and I go for a parry and the first time I just went around and saw, tried to see if I could get a backstab, which, uh, you know, probably wouldn't have killed them. And then eventually I do try to bait a parry. So it, it can be useful to just, you know, utilize the different skill levels for different things. If you just kind of kill everybody immediately, you may not practice some of these more difficult skills because you have opponents that will kill you really quickly if you do try to practice them and you kill all the opponents that are worse than you immediately. So... Uh, this has been a, a pretty long and hopefully informative discussion of this build and kind of the basics when it comes to invasions in PvP. And uh, I'll leave you with this last clip that just kind of um, shows what you can do when you kind of have a plan. So right now I have Stamp Uppercut on my Ash of War, and I do get a nice Stamp Uppercut off the edge. And I just kind of enjoyed that particular invasion. Sometimes you can kind of have a plan and try to execute it. And sometimes it works. So I tried to kind of lure that player over to an area where I could eat them over the edge and it ended up working. Obviously it's not always gonna be that way, but it's important to kind of, you know, try some fun things and just enjoy PVP in general. So speaking of kind of enjoying PVP in general, uh, we're gonna be looking at one of uh, kind of the joys of PvP, which is killing AFK players who allow you to spawn into their world in an area that you can't easily reach. So I'm using the Marika's Hammer weapon swap. Um, I, I guess it's kind of a glitch, but it's been available for a long time, and I only use it in the context of trying to get to players who are... Um, in areas that you can't get to. So you, you will see me use that here. And I also take a minute to just kind of talk about this build as a whole. So it is gonna be a, a great place to start. And I would say stick with it, even if you're not having much success with it initially. I think a lot of players who kind of have done PVP for a long time have found that the Claymore is a fantastic way to start, and even though it's not the easiest weapon to start with, it is one of the most rewarding and just one that you'll be able to kind of appreciate long term. So hopefully if you give it a try and stick with it, it does kind of reward you in the end, and I just kind of hope that you learn something in the process here. If you made it this far, I just wanted to say thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate the support. I also wanted to say that I am thinking about doing more introductory based content since I have done a lot of intermediate and advanced builds and showcases. So if this was useful to you, definitely let me know. And if you have any other kind of beginner content or intermediate or advanced content that you would like to see, definitely let me know in the comments below. As always, thank you so much and I hope you have a good one.